Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Before we get going here, just want to give a shout out to the Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. Uh, if if you have personally benefited from this show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter, a patron. You can find the link in the description. Lord willing, uh, this will be like a, a full-time thing for me. So depending on how many Patreon supporters I get, uh, that would be fantastic. So seriously, if you guys uh, want to support me, that's how to do it. You can also subscribe on YouTube to find all the new episodes. I try to do two a week. And then uh, a third way is to go to Apple Podcasts and leave me a five-star review. That would be sweet. Today, we're touching on brain in a vat and simulation hypothesis yet again. Uh, I love thinking about this kind of things, these kind of things, skept global skeptical threats, things like that. And the simulation hypothesis comes up almost every day for me. People ask me about it. So I'm super excited to come at it from a different angle. We're going to be talking about Bayesian reasoning and stuff that I am always over my head in. So I have with me Dr. Mike Humer and uh, Nate Lawfer. And Nate, uh, many of you will know, has been on an episode prior. We we're talking about disagreement literature. Nate is a PhD candidate at uh, Northwestern, and he's doing a P uh, P dissertation in epistemology. And Mike Humer is an absolute legend. Many consider him to be the greatest living philosopher. And he specializes in philosophy generally construed because this guy has papers on everything in, in philosophy. It's insane. So without further ado, let me pull these guys in. Dr. Humer, Nate, hey, guys, thanks so much for, for coming on the podcast today. All right. Thanks for having us. Yeah, fun to be here. So, so Nate's taught me a ton, and I asked Nate to come on to, to help draw out further things uh, in Dr. Humor's thought. And I've been trying to get at a self-defeat type argument for the simulation hypothesis for a while, and Nate just will not let me have it. He just keeps hammering me, and he's like, why don't you go Bayesian reasoning, dude? Just go with probabilities. I'm like, dude, I'm not good at that stuff. So uh, sure. he, actually, he actually pointed me to your paper, Dr. Humor, a couple months back, and we were going to do an episode on it. Uh, but we thought, man, it'd be even better to get you uh, on talking about it. Uh, real quick before we jump in, uh, Nate had brought up an interesting point that he can he can do better than me. But uh, basically, you know, as um, your epistemology goes, it seems like you might not need this argument. Um, Nate, can you can you bring up that that question that you had? Uh, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> Dr. Humor, you uh, you're really well known for um, endorsing phenomenal conservatism. Um, right. Are you well known for actually having? Um, developed the view and in its in its first incarnation? So I coined the term and okay. um, you know I gave an explicit statement of it. I think there are similar views in earlier people. Like I think okay. Richard Swinburne had a similar idea before. Yeah, yeah, but right. Nobody called it this. Right, yeah. So uh, what, what Parker's gesturing at is just that, so the view roughly speaking is something like if it seems to you that P, then absent defeaters, you have some degree of justification to believe that P. Um, and I was I was wondering um, whether or not somebody who goes in for this sort of view, if there's no restriction on the content of a seeming, uh, whether or not you would actually even need this kind of uh, more rationalist approach that uh, that is described in the paper we're about to talk about. We haven't really said what that, that approach is in much detail, but the idea is like, you kind of like give like a refutation of skeptical hypotheses. Um, and I was just wondering if you, if you go in for phenomenal conservatism, um, do you really need that kind of argument at hand in order to have justification to believe um, these mundane empirical matters like this is a hand? Um, yeah, what do you think about uh, this question? Um, so no, so yeah, so there's, you know, two different responses to brain and about skepticism that I gave at different times. And one of them is, well, you know, if you have a direct realist view of perceptual knowledge or justification, then, you know, the brain in the vat argument sort of doesn't get a purchase to begin with, right? So, um, I mean, what the, what the skeptic is trying to do is provide an alternative hypothesis that explains the same evidence. And uh, if you construe your evidence as consisting of facts about your mental states, then it is an alternative explanation. But if you construe your evidence as consisting of physical facts, you know, facts about your immediate physical environment, then it's not an explanation of the evidence at all. Right? Mm. Not only not an equally good one, but it you know, do doesn't, because, you know, it doesn't explain the fact that there's a hand here, right? Mm -hmm. 
um, explains my having a sensory experience of a hand, but doesn't explain the hand being here. So it doesn't explain the evidence. Hmm. Okay. No, that's that's really interesting. Nate, do you, do you want to follow up or should we jump in? Yeah, right. Um, so I, I guess here's another way of here's another way of kind of getting at the point I was uh, I, I had in mind. It was that uh, I, I want I wonder if um, I wonder if uh, on your view one even needs the kind of argument at hand that you develop in that paper. Um, in order to have that kind of justification. And my sense is your answer to that question is, no, you don't really need to have that ready to hand so long as it seems to you this way, this way absent defeaters. Um, and so then I want it, so then like I, so then I take it like the, your interest in this project is just to point out that skeptical theories provide really poor explanations, not so much to actually get at what really does underwrite the justification of ordinary empirical beliefs, right? Uh, I guess, well, um, I mean, so it's, you know, might, might as well have two responses to skepticism, <laughs> right? And I, right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. Um, But also, I mean, um, I started to think about this partly because, you know, you could raise um, skeptical scenarios or, you know, skeptic-like scenarios about beliefs that are inferential, <laughs> like... Mm -hmm uncontroversially inferential, I guess, like so that even direct realists would say that they were inferential. So uh, like suppose that you think that, um, yeah, we're directly aware of um, observable features of the surfaces of physical objects. Okay, and then you could have a skeptical scenario where the surfaces are there in the out in space around you, but like whatever, you know, there's nothing behind them. Um, there's like, maybe there's an evil demon who creates these surfaces of things in front of you to yeah. deceive you or whatever. So yeah, it would be good to have a response to that as well as the standard kind of skepticism where there's no physical world at all. Hmm. Okay. Gotcha. I, I follow you now. Yeah. yeah. So for those who, who've gotten lost, uh, the, the question is basically, um, why can't you just take Dr. Humor's uh, epistemology and say, well, it seems to me like I'm not a brain in a vet, so therefore I'm not a brain in a vet. And this is just a, another argument further showing that you're probably not a brain in a vat and not probably in like a weak sense. Cause sometimes people think, Oh, well probably not. Well, you can't completely rule it out. Then, um, then, then you can't be justified. And uh, Dr. Humor, I think in this paper too, you kind of just wrote, you said, look, if you're that kind of skeptic, then this is not, uh, this is not directed at you. We're, we're the target of the paper is the justification skeptic uh, who's saying, uh, you you don't have any justification for any of your beliefs if you can't rule out brain in a vat. Uh, you can't believe you're you're living in the world uh, in the real world. But uh, who who I guess are you ruling out? Do you remember who, who is who's the, what kind of skeptic are you saying? Hey, we're I'm probably not going to convince you. That's if if you're a infallibleist, maybe right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, if you're a certainty skeptic. Like yeah. Peter Unger, I guess. And you know, your whole thing is, oh, well, we can't be absolutely certain of any whatever contingent propositions about the external world. Uh, I think that's true and uninteresting, right? Mm. And yeah. so like, okay, so then after you accept that, then what do you do? Well, then you just act exactly like everyone else. You just like keep forming beliefs just like everyone else <laughs> and yeah. you still behave the same way. And you just don't use the word certain, right? And then, <laughs> You know, and then you stop using the word no because you think that the word no implies certainty, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, but the, uh, the justification skeptic thinks, well, you don't even have justification for external world beliefs. And there's an argument for that that's almost the same yeah. as the certainty argument, but it just has a much more interesting conclusion. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for those uh, interested, this paper is Serious Theories and Skeptical Theories, Why You Are Probably Not a Brain in a Vet by Dr. Michael Humer. And um, I, I was thinking maybe I'll just go through the the argument that you give uh, from the skeptic uh, for the brain in the brain in the vat skeptic who is the justification skeptic, and then we can go through how you go about answering it. So uh, I don't I don't know if I want to read all these premises. It's kind of hard to do in a podcast. But the the overall uh, thrust is uh, I'm justified in believing that I live in the real world only if I'm justified in rejecting the brain in a vat hypothesis and. Uh, well, premise three says, I have no a priori justification for rejecting the brain and vat hypothesis. Premise four uh, predicts that my sensory experiences would be just as they are 
uh, whether I'm in the brain in a vat or whether I'm in the real world. And so because of these certain factors, I'm not able to, I'm not justified in rejecting the brain in the vat hypothesis. Therefore, I can't be justified in actually believing I live, I live in the real world. Does that sound right, uh, Nate and, and Dr. Humor there? Right, yeah, sounds right. Sweet. All right. Well, um, so can you lay out like how, how do you uh, analyze this? Uh, maybe we could talk about broad and narrow uh, conceptions of the brain in the vat. Yeah, I mean, you know, what I what I always wanted to hear when when people were talking about brain and vat skepticism was basically, um, you know, why is this not a good theory? Mm -hmm. Like the theory that you're a brain in a vat, why is that not a good explanation of our evidence or whatever? Um, and uh, you hear a lot of other things that epistemologists say, that, like a, a lot of semantic points and like, oh, you know, the meaning of no changes depending on the context or whatever, a lot of stuff that just wasn't answering what I wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear the like semantic theories. Um, yeah, why is it not a good theory? Okay, and um, if, you, if you take the brain the bat theory as simply the theory that your experiences are explained by, um, you know, scientists and a computer stimulating your brain, then that's compatible with any possible sequence of experiences, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you know, many people notice this about skeptical scenarios, right? Also true of the deceiving God and evil genius and, and the dream argument. Uh, no matter what happens, the theory explains it in the same way, right? Like if you yeah. experience E, the theory says, and the scientist programmed you to experience E. Right. Just plug in anything for E and that's the explanation. Okay, anyway, so, um, that means that the theory is unfalsifiable, mm -hmm. which is generally considered to be a bad thing. Unfortunately, a lot of the people who talk about falsifiability have no idea why it's bad to be unfalsifiable, and they never tell you why that's bad. Like, it can't be proven false. Oh, why isn't that good? That yeah, should be super like, awesome. You can't. That means it'll never wrong. be proven false, which is good because right. you don't want it to be proven false. Anyway. Um, yeah, the problem is, you know, on Bayesian grounds, if you can't have evidence against a theory, then you also can't have evidence for it. Hmm. All right. So like, you know, E is evidence in favor of a theory, if and only if the failure of E to happen um, is evidence against it. Yeah. And so, yeah, so there's an extremely wide range of possible experiences, and almost none of them look just like you're living the real world. And this is the this is the broad conception, right? Um, how did I use the terminology? So so broad broad yeah. and narrow interpretation of brain in a vat, and, and the yeah. broad one is like, yeah, there's all these possible ways that uh, a brain in a vat yeah. could experience things. Yeah, right. Yeah, so the broad interpretation would be just that your brain in a vat, and so just giving the explanation of where your experiences come from. The narrow interpretation would be the theory stipulates um, a bunch of stuff to ensure that you have experiences just like the ones you're currently having right. in the real world. Yeah. Okay, so just taking the broad brain in a vat hypothesis, the problem is that there's a low likelihood. Right? So there's a low probability of E given H. So uh, in this case, meaning there's a low probability of your having experiences just like those of a person perceiving the real world, given just that your brain in a vat. Yeah. And the reason for that is, well, the theory is compatible with the full range of possible experiences, and most possible experiences don't look like the experiences of a person, you know, living in the real world, right? Yeah. And when I say most, I mean like, you know, well over 99.999 and repeat that like 50 times percent. Well, Dr. Hummer, where, where, where does that... I follow that, and I like that, and and Nate's helped me with that. Where does that come from? Why sh why should someone think that there's all these experiences uh, that are not like ours that are that are possible? Yeah. So you know, the majority of experiences would not look like experiences representing a real world, um, and uh, this is sort of a combinatorics fact, right? Okay. So here's a little experiment that I did on my computer. Although I did not need to do the experiment because I already knew. And if you understand what's going on, you already know what's going to happen. But anyway, here's the experiment. I programmed the computer to generate random images. And then, and it's, it's super simple, right? And then just generate like a thousand of these images and then look at them. And not a single one looks like anything, right? <laughs> so by random images, I mean like, okay, you know, it has 2 million colors or something. So pick a random color and assign it Assign a random color to each pixel on the screen. 
Okay, and then you do that like a thousand times. You could do it a billion times and look at the images and not a single one would look like anything. Mm -hmm. They all just look like snow, right? Like, yeah, like static. Um, and so and so then, you know, that's that's when you realize that, yeah, the percentage of possible experiences that look like they represent normal objects is extremely small. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you see what's going like, you know, when you think about it and like, you know, a little bit about combinatorics, you know that like I could do this if I had the computing resources, I could, you know, do like 10 to the 20 of these and probably none of them would look like anything. It probably do 10 to the 100. Yeah. Okay. I, I appreciate that you even included one uh, in in your paper. That's right. Yeah. This, this is what I'm talking about. Here you go. Um, so yeah. Yeah. By so the way, me, so you know, yeah. it's only a black and white image in the paper, but I did it in color on the computer. Yeah. Um, but they still all, if you you know, back away at a distance, they all look like a gray square. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Because that's the average color of the pixels. <laughs> yeah. It's like the fuzz on your TV when. I don't know if this happens anymore, but yeah, when the signal goes out yeah, and stuff. It used to happen, yeah. I don't see it ever now. People, they're getting really good with TV and hooking us in. Uh, yeah, now so that they have cable, yeah. Yeah, so we have um, we have this principle of indifference. Nate, uh, can you set that? Like, I didn't, I, I didn't like principles of indifference, mostly because I read Bostrom's paper and I saw what it was doing and where it leads you. And then Nate was like, actually, I like uh, principles of indifference. <laughs> and, and Dr. Humer, you've done some work on that too, so. Nate, can you can you explain like what a principle of indifference is for us? Uh, yeah, Dr. Hume is probably better at formulating this. He's done. He's actually done work on this. Um, but uh, I want I wanted to just quick like chime in on like the previous point. Like uh, this probably just like adds more grist to your mill, uh, Dr. Humer. But like there's also like other dimensions along which um, your experience could just like look like complete noise, right? So like you you give the example with just like it like something visual in the paper. But like with respect to say like what you might even like the sounds you might hear, right? Like that that also can just be incoherent or complete noise in way more ways in which it can actually be like meaningful, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, you know, when you when you add in the fact that your visual experiences are correlated with auditory experiences, like you see me and then you also hear sounds that are appropriate, yeah. <laughs> um, right? Then, you know, that just multiplies the improbability by more. And, and right. olfactory stuff too. I'm not smelling you guys right here, but I smell yeah. some stuff going on in my office too. That's right. Yeah. Nice, nice, Nate. That's good. Dude. Yeah. I like that. Right. So yeah, think about all the different dimensions in which your experience could vary, and the fact that um, you're having predictable combinations of experience um, is is remarkable. You might say. Yeah. Would you Would you call that? Um, like intelligibility, the fact that, that we have an intelligible experience or like a systematic or coherent experience? Yeah, right. Okay. Well, me yeah, meaning, so basically meaning the type of experience that you could interpret as representing um, uh, lasting physical objects in, in the real world. Yeah, okay. Um, um, so actually, yeah. you had asked about principles of indifference. Yeah, but please. Nate didn't really explain. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I mean, like there, there are, I mean, you said I like those principles, Parker. I, I like carefully formulated versions of this principle, <laughs> right. um, but 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 I mean, even carefully formulated ones, I'm sure, like are uh, susceptible to certain kinds of counterexamples. I guess I guess what I was saying uh, in that one conversation you're thinking of is that I think some version of this of the principle of indifference has to be true, like mm -hmm. some version. I don't know exactly how it's spelled out, but the principle is roughly something like. Um, it's it's easiest to think of it. Uh, it's easy. It's, I, I find it easiest and most intuitive to think about it uh, with examples, right? So there's there's a prize behind either door number one or door number two, and I don't have any I don't have any information beyond the fact that it's behind one of those doors, right? So um, the strength of my reasons, like with respect to its being in door one or door two, is like it's just complete. There's just complete symmetry, um, right? And um, this the symmetry is kind of born out of the fact that I don't really have any more reason than the other, right? So the strength of the of the reasoning of the reasons is symmetrical because I don't really have much to go on <laughs> in the first place, right? Right. It's not like I have some sort of source of information saying it's in door number one or it's in door number two, right? I'm just certain it's in one of them. Um, in situations like that, 
I think my degree of confidence should be just split even that it's in door number one and door number two, right? So I'm point five, point five confidence in door number one, point five confidence in door number two. Um, and the same kind of reasoning applies when you have um, even more options. So if there's three doors, similar reasoning applies, I should be one third confident in each one. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like the rough idea behind the principle, but there are, uh, there are various ways of formulating this uh, so that there's precision and you're uh, not as susceptible to certain kinds of counterexamples. Yeah. Well, Dr. Humer, how, so how do you use um, your principle of indifference here to argue against this, this broad view of broad conception of brain and event? Yeah. So, I mean, the initial thought was, oh, so conditional on your being a brain of that, um, if we don't know anything else, hmm. uh, we would say every possible sequence of experiences is equally likely because, you know, they're all compatible with being a brain of that. Yeah. So, okay. And then, so then the set of experiences that are coherent and intelligible, as you say, is, um, you know, just a tiny fraction of the total range. So it has a tiny probability, right? So probability of our having experiences like the ones we're actually having conditional on being a brain of that is incredibly small. Right now, at some point in the paper, I realized that that might not be the right way to apply the principle of indifference. Mm -hmm. The right way to apply it might be, um, you know, look at the possible motivations and capabilities that the people stimulating the brain might have and, you know, give equal probabilities over those possibilities, okay? Yeah. So then I think you get a less robust, um, you know, you get a less impressive refutation of the brain of that, like you get less extreme probabilities, but I still think it's improbable. Yeah. Right? So like the, the, the range of people who could, if you consider like all the possible um, brain stimulating scientists and computers, uh, most of them would not be like this. Right? Like almost all of them would make errors so that, you know, you would see that it was not just like normal real life, right? Mm. Yeah. So, so, okay. So the, the first one, uh, the broad conception, just the, the probability that you have a intelligible experience is so, so small that it's, you can, you can rule out, we're probably not living in a computer simulation because we do have intelligible experiences. And if we were, we'd probably be in one of the other incoherent ones and we'd just be seeing fuzz. But now you, you give a couple different, uh, characteristics, the, the purposes of the scientist, the, the capabilities of the apparatus, and then the skills of the scientist. And that's that's yeah. the more charitable way, I guess. I don't even want to, I wish, I just want to stick with the, the really hardcore one that, that really yeah. hard, but can you, uh, you, you just kind of laid it out for us a little bit. Can you go in a little bit more depth, uh, what you mean by like the, the purpose and the capabilities and the skills of the scientist? Yeah, like the people who are stimulating the brain, you know, what are their motives? Like, what are they trying to do? Mm -hmm. And um, and you try to think like, what would their motives have to be so that our experience would be just like this? And like, the only thing I can come up with is they want to make it look just like you're not a brain in a vat, right? <laughs> like, yeah. but if, and, and you know, why? <laughs> but if you take any other motive uh, and you know, if you think about motives that would make sense or the things that you would be trying to do if you created a brain in a vat, um, you know, none of them match our experience, right? So like if a utilitarian was creating a brain of that or just a benevolent person, they would make the experience much better than this. Mm. It wouldn't be nearly as much suffering. Yeah. Or like maybe it was, uh, maybe it's like an artist, you know, who's creating the brain of that, right? So that there would be like, there would just be interesting stories, right? Well, then our, my life would be a lot more interesting than it is also. <laughs> or, you know, more beautiful or whatever, like, or maybe, you know, these are people who value knowledge. Okay. Well then there would be, my life would be teaching more important, valuable lessons and things like that. Right. Yeah. It just doesn't seem to be anything like our life is not aiming at anything mm -hmm. other than looking just like you're not a brain, <laughs> like <laughs> just like you're living in the real world and just stuff is happening randomly. Right. Well, Dr. Hamer, what if what if you're like Elon Musk and you're considering this and he's listening to this episode and he's well, about to tweet it out. We're going to get a bunch of views. Thanks to him. Uh, and he's like, look, I'm Elon Musk. What are the chances that I mean, would he have a different uh, probability going from his own experience than I mean, you're my humor. That's kind of a big yes. deal. But but Parker said a case like you guys versus me. Right. Like, <laughs> like both this show yeah. and Bitcoin just like rise in popularity. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Elon Musk has more reason to suspect that he's a brain in a vat, right? Okay. Uh, than the rest of us do. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, it sounds funny, but I think that's correct, right? Like if you have a really remarkable, interesting life, and also if it's like really awesome, <laughs> then yeah, then it's less likely that it's real. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. That's good to know. Um, okay. Okay. So we have, um, we, we've got those three, the, the capabilities of the apparatus. That one uh, I'm not super clear on, I guess. Like I could see people saying, well, this is kind of like Bostrom's like, hey, uh, the capabilities of the apparatus should be super good. Maybe this is, uh, maybe the simulation that you're in is way less advanced. It's a hundred years uh, prior. And so the capabilities, who knows in the future, how, how good the capabilities are. What, what are you getting at when, when you're talking about that uh, characteristic? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, think about, it. well, if somebody was trying to make a brain out of that, actually, they would probably run into a bunch of problems, right? Okay. So, um, um, I don't know, like you got to stick all this stuff into the brain and you have to stimulate it in really precise ways. And like, it's really hard to just have the hardware that can do that mm -hmm. and to have it not constantly make mistakes, right? Um, also, you have to have a pretty amazing computer because mm -hmm. you know, like when I when I play computer games, um, frequently there are these um, you know lags and like frame rate problems, right? So that um, you know, kind of like it kind of reminds you that you're playing a game, right? Yeah. Um, so it has to be a pretty amazing apparatus just in terms of the hardware, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. And you know, there's just like there's a wider range of things that could be. Now you could describe a scenario in which this makes sense. But you're picking, like, you have to, so to speak, you have to pick parameter values that are very specific, right? Yeah. Out of the range of possible values that those parameters could have, and that that will change the probability as well. Yeah, like the more specific stipulations you have to make, the lower is the probability, right? Yeah. I, I was actually wondering something on this point. So, um, I, so I wonder what you think about the following objection. Like, fine, that's a problem for like the brain of that theories, but it might not be a problem for say like Cartesian demons or something like that, right? So you don't have to there's, you don't you don't have to you don't have to introduce that much more content to just say well the demon just kind of like he's got he's got the power and know how he just does it to you. <laughs> I don't know. What do you what do you think about so so what do you think about the criticism that that's just a liability of like the brain of that sort of scenario and not like some other skeptical scenarios? Well, um, I mean, you might say there are, there are analogous parameters for demons, right? There can be more yeah. and less powerful demons and there could be more and less benevolent demons and they could have a wide range of um, different possible motives. So, um, and also sort of like capabilities, like, you know, how often they make mistakes and so on. And so you have to set those parameters to very specific values, right? Um, yeah. So I, I'm thinking about a move that say, so you mentioned Swinburne earlier, right? And he, when he, when he formulates theism as a hypothesis, um, yeah. he thinks that like the simplest version of theism is going to be, um, well, surprise for surprise, his preferred version of it, <laughs> but, but also, yeah. but also um, it's going to be one on which like the powers of God are maximal because it's just kind of part of um, standard scientific practice, at least according to Swinburne that um, we, we like to go for extreme, uh, extreme values uh, and extreme quantities, right? So it's, it's more it's elegant to go for zero or infinity, yeah. right? So the simplest demon hypothesis is one where the demon's omnipotent, right? And so there you go, yeah, you deal with well, uh, some of these that's things. I don't know, what do you think of that? I mean, that seems extremely weak, right? <laughs> like, um, okay, let's say, you know, this is before we had an estimate of the mass of the sun. And somebody says, okay, so the simplest theories are that it has zero mass or infinity. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I don't know if those are the simplest, but those definitely aren't the most likely, right? <laughs> I um, mean, might they be simplest a priori though? Like, so I wonder if what militates against, what, what makes that sound kind of crazy is that there's some empirical information that's doing some epistemic work in yeah. the background. I don't know, what do you think of that? Yeah, I don't know, I mean, um, so, you know, take something that's, uh, um, I don't know, I, I was going to say, take something that we have less information about, although like before we knew what the sun was, very little information. Okay, so let's say, I don't know, you're looking at stars up in the sky before people had any idea of what they were. And you go, okay, so they're, they probably either have zero mass or infinity mass. 
Like, no, right? That's not it's yeah. not likely. But um, also, I mean, I just think like the appeal to simplicity is an extremely weak appeal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like it has very little evidential force. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another paper in which I talk about why simplicity matters. And basically, it's it's sort of a rule of thumb that simpler theories tend to be more falsifiable, but not necessarily, just yeah. usually. Right. Um, the reason for this is when you introduce when you uh, introduce complexities into a theory, then you typically you have more parameters that you can adjust to try to accommodate possible data. Hmm. Um, so, you know, like and this is connected to the stuff I'm saying about the brain, the VAT scenario that you can adjust the parameters of, to accommodate any possible data. That's like the worst, right? yeah. the worst situation. Yeah. OK, but anyway, so uh, if you think that's why simplicity matters, then, you know what? Like, why would it be better to set um, parameter values to the extremes? Like, mm -hmm. right? That like that doesn't does that make it the theory more more testable? I'm not sure about that. Um, I think also though. I mean, I think so. I have um, you know idiosyncratic views. So I think certain kinds of infinities are impossible. So I think that uh, having infinite power might be metaphysically impossible. Mm -hmm. So you know that's a whole another discussion there. Yeah, part part three. Uh, okay, so so let me draw us back. So we got uh, we have this broad conception of brain in a vat, and uh, the conclusion of, of your argument here is that if I were a brain in a vat, my experience would almost certainly not be indistinguishable from that of a normal person. Um, okay, so the the broad uh, construal is so improbable. Uh, that you're probably not a brain in a vat. And that's in a really strong sense, whether uh, you take it just generally speaking, or if you add uh, these criteria of the scientists and their apparatus and stuff. So the broad one's out. And I think a lot of people will be okay with that. They'll say, well, fine, sure. Because what I had in mind is I'm being, uh, my brain's being stimulated by a scientist in this narrow conception that wants to give me the particular experience that I'm having here. And uh, here, I think you rule this one. You, you say this one can be ruled out a priori. Uh, is that right, Dr. Hummer? Um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, you can't be certain that that's not true, but it's improbable. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, um, okay, like the reason, so you can have either a low likelihood or a low prior probability oh, right. for the theory, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, in Bayes' theorem, the probability of H given E equals the prior probability of H times the probability of E given H all divided by the probability of E. Mm -hmm. prior probability v. Okay, so um, like I was just saying, oh, probability v given h is really low. Okay, and then you say, no, no, I'm going to build a bunch of stipulations into h that turn probability v given h into 100%, mm -hmm. right? So I'll just stipulate the values of the parameters as part of the theory. Okay, but then what you do is you just reduce the probability of the prior probability of h by exactly the same ratio, right? Oh, yeah. So like, you know, yeah, E given H goes up to one and then pH goes down, probability of H goes down. So you haven't you haven't increased the uh, probability at all. Yeah, right. So like there's no there's no free lunch here, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So that would be that would be again if if uh, on the narrow uh, conception that there there's a scientist who wants you to have your particular uh, experience. Does does yeah. this one change at all to uh, it seems to me like this uh, Reputation or argument against the narrow uh, would apply equally to Elon Musk as it would Parker set a case. Is that right? Um, hmm. um, it seems that way. Uh, I'm thinking maybe you know probability of E given real world hypothesis is lower in okay. that case, right? When he has a really yeah. interesting life, yeah, less less likely given non brain in a vat. Um, okay. Uh, oh, oh no! I guess um, yeah. I was thinking that um, the pro if you're creating a brain in a vat, you're more likely to program it to have interesting experiences rather than just some random mundane set of uh, experiences. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Nate, any thoughts on that? No. I. I that sounds right. <laughs> okay. Okay. So so one more time. So then. Uh, Wait, it might be the in the the inverse or the the converse or whatever. Um, the first one, it if you if you're Elon Musk in the broad conception of the brain in a vat, 
then it's more likely that you are brain in a vat. In this one, um, likewise, right? Uh, the yeah. same thing. Elon Musk is screwed, basically. Yeah, well, he's more likely to be a brain in a vat than okay. you and I are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or rather, okay. you know, from his own point of view, right? Yeah. From my so, point of view, I know he's not one. But <laughs> so, so in my, I'm the most safe here. Uh, we got Elon Musk, then we probably got Mike Humor, then we got Nate, and then we got Parker. And so I'm most likely not a brain in a vat, and you guys a little bit more probable. Right. Yeah. That's I guess great. That's, yeah. So I mean, you know, just to like, um, I don't know, this is repeating sort of. Sure. But you know, when you build a bunch of stuff into the brain in the vat scenario, like you build in information about the um, the scientists and what their motivations are and whatever, um, then that version of the brain of that scenario now has to compete with all possible other versions of the brain of that scenario. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, which means, you know, so you've got to divide the probability, you know, using some kind of principle of indifference, divide the probability. The, t the probability of being a brain of that overall, you have to divide it among all the different versions of the scenario with different specifications of the motivations and capabilities of the scientists. Yeah. Right? And so because there's a wide range of that, you know, it only gets a small amount of probability. Yeah. And so Can I ask you a question? Oh, sorry, Nate, go ahead, Margaret. Jump in, Nate, jump in, yeah. So what do you what do you think about um, just the disjunction of these very specific skeptical hypotheses? So just just consider the probability of that on the evidence. Uh, do you, I, I take it you're gonna say the situation isn't isn't much different. I mean, there's more um, that 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 view is gonna have a, a better prior probability, perhaps, but it's still yeah. gonna suffer on similar grounds with respect to just like predicting the evidence. Is that right? Yeah, right. So, you know, oh, okay, maybe I'm a brain of a brain of that, or like I'm a simulated yeah. person I'm in a computer system, or there's an evil demon, or I have a dream that's weirdly coherent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There aren't that many of these scenarios actually. So like in all of them have a really small probability. So, you know, so the disjunction of the four, I guess has the sum, you know, it has mm -hmm. as its probability, the sum of the probabilities of the individual scenarios, but that's still not very high. So if you, if you made a bunch more like 25 of them, would that, <laughs> would that raise things or no? Um, yes, but you're going to have a hard time thinking of 25 that are really like competing how about right, like I, just variations I, I, of these four? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You're also just going to like be probably like, I mean, at, you, you might think it's easy to just dream up 25, right? But I take it kind of what you're thinking, Dr. Humor, is like, well, the, min the minute you try to dream up that many, you probably are ined inevitably adding content that's going to actually um, result in diminishing returns, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, you could say I'm a brain in a vat and I'm on Mars. <laughs> Whatever. That's right. Yeah. That's <laughs> really helpful. Um, although, you know, this, this sounds like a different scenario. Maybe you're a kidney in a vat, right? Because, you know, if none of your experiences are veridical, maybe kidneys are the organs that give rise to consciousness. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, sounds like a different scenario. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, just like take the general scenario. I'm some organ that generates consciousness in a vat. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, Man, you might have just started a new skeptical threat, Dr. Humor. There's people, this is going to be on YouTube. I don't, I mean, people are crazy on YouTube. They might take that and run with it. And that is going to be a bunch of kidney folks out there thinking they're right, kidneys. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, could, it could be that you're a tire in a vat because maybe tires are conscious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Depending on, on which theory of mind you hold, maybe if uh, extended mind thesis holds, uh, you could be all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, whatever, a, all sorts of little particles. Yeah. So, so I wanted to, to turn this in uh, to, I wanted to now turn to consider uh, the simulation hypothesis because Nate's been telling me for a couple of years now that I, I just need to take this Bayesian approach to the simulation hypothesis if, if I'm going to argue against it at all. Um, maybe, maybe it's, maybe we shouldn't, but um, actually, really quick. Uh, Dr. Humor and Nate, uh, is is improbability a reason for rejection? Be before we move on to the simulation, uh, it's improbable that your brain in a vat, whether broadly construed or narrowly construed, is that a reason to reject the the brain in a vat hypothesis? Sounds like sounds like a reason to reject, right? I mean, unless you're asking a much more subtle question than it sounds like. Yes. Don't. Yeah, it's it's not as subtle. <laughs> um, I just thinking for for people who are listening, there's a uh, 
they do the dumb and dumber uh gif where it's like so you're saying there's a chance right for for a lot of people when you say probability so there's still this probability it's still probable or it's not probable it's possible it's just yeah it's it's possible Ooh, but yeah. yeah it's very very improbable like and the what we're talking about here is so much so that you could say we're not living uh you're not a brain in a vat it would be so it's rational to believe that you're not a brain in a vat right Okay. Yeah. You know, okay. It's still, it's still okay. possible or whatever. Okay, but you know, think about things like, um, oh, you know, sometimes you hear after you learn about thermody thermodynamics, you hear that it's possible that all the air in this room could like spontaneously migrate into the corner and then I would suffocate. Right. Oh, okay, we need to worry about that. No, we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> like, okay, so that is possible. The probability of that is non-zero, mm -hmm. but nobody should ever worry about that happening. <laughs> Okay. Uh, it's, you know, it has never happened and it's not going to happen before the sun swallows up the earth right? in, the, okay. in the time that we have left. That's good. I actually never had that fear until right now. So thank <laughs> you. <Adam. laughs> but there are ways to motivate the idea that maybe improbability isn't sufficient for rejection. Right. And I think some of those ways are actually considered in this paper. So, I mean, here's here's one uh, way to motivate this idea. So, um, so here's a case. I roll I roll some dice. And they land under the couch. I don't see them. Really, really improbable that it landed snake eyes. Should I? Am I reasonable to believe it didn't roll snake eyes? That's, I mean, um, it's one over thirty-six. It's not that improbable. So. But I mean, but I mean, like once you start, yeah, right. When you say one in thirty-six, it sounds like oh, it, like what Parker was saying. The whole you're saying there's a chance sort of reasoning. I think really kicks in. But there are different ways of actually expressing that probability, right? Like 0.9 something chance it did it. Um, and now I'm, and yeah. now I'm kind of like, oh, wait a minute. Point nine is sufficient in other settings for me. So why wouldn't it be in this setting? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah um... There are conflicting intuitions about what probability can do, um, right? Yeah. So, so I'm just yeah, curious. So, you know, clearly, you should have a low credence that it landed double ones or it landed snake eyes. Um, should you outright believe that it? didn't. Um, I don't know, probably not, I guess. Right. So, they, but so, um, you know, there's, um, there's an interesting question about why sometimes we just form the outright belief and it doesn't entirely supervene on the probability. So there could be cases where you outright believe P and, you know, you don't outright believe Q, but Q is more probable than P. <laughs> Okay, well, what could explain this? Well, there are these different prag pragmatic factors. So when you form the outright belief, so that is not just having a high credence, it's taking you know, a further attitude. The further attitude um, includes something like, well, I've closed the inquiry into this question, so I'm not gonna be worrying about it anymore or something like that. That doesn't mean that it won't ever be reopened, right? But it does mean that like you're now not deliberating about whether that's true. And when you decide to make decisions, another thing that sometimes said is when you decide to make decisions, um, you will just use the proposition. You won't use the probability of the proposition in your reasoning. Mm. Like I'm try trying to decide what to do. I'll just use P in the proposition. I won't use probability of P is over 97%. So anyway, okay, so there are things like that. And so when is it rational to form the outright belief? Well, when it's rational to, to have those other attitudes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that could depend upon things like, um, well, how costly is it to gather more information? Because like, if it's super easy to gather more information, then um, don't close the inquiry, right? But if you've got all the information you're ever going to have, then that sort of, that tends to push down the threshold for closing the inquiry, right? Hmm. Um, also oh. depends upon what the costs and benefits are. Like if there's a, you know, if there's a huge cost to being wrong, then that pushes the threshold up. Yeah. So this is interesting. So if I start, if I start having a life that looks more and more like Elon Musk's, is the is the inquiry sort of like opening again? And so now I should think of the brain in a bad hypothesis in the same way that I think of the proposition that the dice landed snake eyes. Um. I mean, I think it would take more than that, right? Yeah. Um, there's there's some point, so, you know, like how people say um, there's no way of refuting the brain of that scenario uh, in the sense that like, there's not a test that definitively shows that you couldn't be brain of that. Um, but um, I mean, there is, like there's stuff that could happen to you. It's just that, um, so there's stuff that could happen. 
So I meant to say there's stuff that could happen that would suggest that you are a brain in a vat. It just never happens, right? Mm -hmm. So like there could you could experience what look like glitches in the program or or whatever, you know, yeah. like the world freezes for a second, right? And then like an error message appears in your <laughs> visual field. <or> whatever. Um, <laughs> right. Or you know how like when you're streaming a video and you don't have enough bandwidth. And then you know stuff happens like the quality of the video goes down, or like you know the the frame rate goes down, so like it doesn't look like it's moving continuously anymore. Right? Yeah. The stuff like that could happen. It's just that that stuff never happens, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So maybe they, uh, maybe maybe it needs to be like more extreme than Elon than becoming like Elon Musk. It's got to be like my experience all of a sudden like pauses and it says buffering or something like that. <laughs> then I should start to be like, okay, maybe I should reopen the <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. And then like, you know, maybe a message appears in the screen that says, um, sorry, you know, I'm, we're working on the error. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're very sorry, you know, uh, uh, we know you've probably forgotten that you signed up to be put into the VAT, but anyway, <laughs> but still we take our customer satisfaction very seriously. <laughs> that's good that's like there's a movie in vanilla sky where that where that happens to to tom cruise spoiler alerts for for anyone uh who wants to watch that so yeah. so moving on to uh to bostrom's argument um just real quick for for those who are, are not familiar bostrom has an argument it's he he doesn't propose the simulation hypothesis himself but he says he gives this argument where there's three premises the third of which is the hypothesis that you're living in a computer simulation the first is um, humans will go extinct before they're capable, uh, technologically capable of making a computer simulation with digital conscious beings. The second one is uh, humans won't go extinct before that, but maybe they don't create conscious digital beings for some moral reason, like it's 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 immoral to do so or, or w whatever the case is. Or three, that we are almost certainly living in a computer simulation. And he says, I, I think he says these are mutually exclusive so and, and jointly exhaustive. So like one of these three is true. If you don't have a reason to affirm one, you think that yes, we will eventually be technologically advanced enough to create conscious uh, simulated beings. Uh, unless you can affirm that, or if you can affirm, uh, unless you can affirm two that we won't do so, which seems kind of improbable. It seems like there's going to be an arms race, and they will make a bunch of these. Then three, you're already you're already living in one. Uh, Doctor Humer, have, have you been able? To, uh, have you looked over Bostrom's argument at all? Yes. Uh, so, you know, it's been, it's been a while, um, but I basically know what the argument is. Um, you know, like, so one of my problems with the argument, like the, my biggest problem or the most fundamental problem is that I don't think that a computer simulation would be conscious. Mm. So like if you, if like somebody ran a simulation of you, I don't think it would be conscious in the way that you are, even if it was a really great simulation. So, you know, so, so there's a, there's a, uh, an objection that uh, someone who's come on the podcast, Dr. Uh, James Anderson, has given, and he, he just brings it up. It's it's basically a Searle's Chinese room argument that um, that uh, there's no such, you can't have a digitally conscious being because there's something important and uh, that you can't replicate. Uh, so machine machine functionalism is out for for one reason or the other. Is that what you're getting at here, Dr. Humor? Yes. Yeah. I mean. You know, it's a presupposition of the simulation argument that if you made a simulation, then there would actually be conscious beings in it. Yeah, the simulated beings would actually be conscious. Um, and yeah, I am basically persuaded by things like the Chinese Rome argument, right? Which which I heard directly from Searle hmm. when I was at UC Berkeley <laughs> when I was an undergraduate, and that was um, that was like um, the first really persuasive philosophical argument that I heard. I think. Where like I was not sure the answer to the question before, beforehand, and then I heard the argument. And I thought, wow, okay, <laughs> like I thought that totally settles it. And then later, to my great disappointment, I learned that um, most philosophers disagree with the argument. Yeah, most most experts in the field, in fact, like philosophers of mind, just completely reject it. Right, and then you know I was very sad by that. Well, so I uh, last time you were on, we talked about how Barry Stroud was your epistemology professor. Now I hear that you're hearing this Chinese room argument from Searle. It's insane. All the people that you've had, you you better be as good as you are, I guess. But uh, I, yeah, I actually, the same. after after undergraduate, then I went to Rutgers and I had um, I had a class with Jerry Fodor. Oh, wow. so I got to hear a Fodor's response to Searle like, and directly from him. Did you? I mean, do you? You say you still uh, like the conclusion, or you still are persuaded by the argument. So Fodor didn't uh, didn't move you at all. Um, 
No, not much. Yeah. Um, I mean, I thought, actually, I kind of thought that he had the best response to it that I'd heard. Um, but, but I still wasn't persuaded. And it was something like, well, um, you know, okay, so you've got this functionalist account of consciousness where uh, in order to be conscious, you have to have a certain pattern of causal relations among your internal states and also your behavior and uh, external stimuli and all that. Um, and okay, but you know, in philosophy, there are a lot of causal accounts of different things. Mm -hmm. And whenever there's a causal theory of something, um, there's a deviant causal chain objection, right? So like, um, so this is an example. What is it to break a glass? Well, it's to perform an action that causes the glass to be broken. Right. And then there's a deviant causal chain counterexample, which is like, well, what if I tell you to drop the glass on the floor? So, and so that causes the glass to be broken, right? But I didn't break the glass, mm -hmm. you broke the glass, right? So anyway, okay. And so Fodor thought, yeah, so if you have a functionalist view of mental states, there's also like this deviant causal chain problem. Um, and, you know, one way of having a deviant causal chain is having another conscious being, um, you know, responsible for the causal links. Uh -huh. right? And so like that's that's virtually always a deviant causal chain. We don't have a good analysis of what a deviant causal chain is, but we know that like that generally counts. Yeah. But that doesn't make you think that causal analyses in general are wrong, right? Like in order to break a glass, you do have to cause it to be broken. It's got something to do with that, right? <laughs> it is causing it to be broken in a certain way, but it's really hard to say the exact way, mm -hmm. but it excludes doing it by means of, you know, causing somebody else to do it. Yeah. Right? And so Fodor's response was like, oh, the guy in the Chinese room, that's sort of, that's just a deviant causal chain, right? Like there are the causal relations that you're supposed to have, but they're not going by the right kind of causal chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know that I find that very satisfying either, um, because that the the Chinese room is just the CPU and a computer, right? Uh, that that was the direct uh, analogy there. So, in a computer, there there is no conscious being uh, yeah, yeah. in the manipulation of the symbols, right? No, yeah. So, um, like Fodor's view is, yeah, in the in a normal real computer, it would be conscious. But yeah. in the Searle version where there's a man in the room. Oh, gotcha. That's the disanalogy. Then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Um, do you know, just off offhand, does this only apply to a computer with the right uh, amount of complexity? Or does, does Fodor think that like this computer that I'm looking at right now is a has a degree of consciousness? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm, I would guess that he would say not because it's not complex enough. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so then, in looking at Bostrom's argument, then you would say uh, you just affirm premise one that it, this is this is not going to happen because I have a hard time actually with this. Um, if you affirm premise one, it makes it it kind of seems like you're <laughs> affirming that if humanity didn't go extinct it, it, by a certain time, then they would have accomplished the uh, scientific uh, sophistication, which could give rise to this. So, how do you go about rejecting? this argument uh you say that there's a suppressed premise or there's a there's an extra premise this, these aren't actually uh, um, jointly exhaustive there's another premise well, and that is that machine functionalism is false yeah actually i think i mean i think that's the thing that bostrom assumes but doesn't discuss separately right mm -hmm. like, he doesn't discuss the idea that um a sufficiently good simulation is actually conscious yeah um and I think that's because he's so confident of that, right? Like he says rest. that in the paper. Yeah, he just goes, "Well, most you know, most philosophers of mind are machine functionalists, so this is fine." Yeah. yeah. So you know, the the other stuff he thinks is more controversial, you know, which is kind of striking. But but it's not unfair of him because that's true about the state of the field, right? Yeah. It's just that I'm idiosyncratic. Um, anyway, so. Yeah, but I mean, the rest of the stages and the reasoning, I'm not really sure of. So like, I'm not sure that we're going to, that humanity is not going to go extinct pretty soon. Yeah. Um, anyway, if we don't go extinct, I'm also not sure that, you know, we're going to run a bunch of simulations of our ancestors or whatever. Yeah. Uh, if we're going to run a bunch of simulations, you know, why would you, why would you sort of waste time programming like boring things like this? Like, like this podcast, most, this is an exciting podcast, Dr. Humor. If, you, if you're going to make 
Yeah, yeah, this is the exciting part of it, but you know, okay, okay, after okay. End, that was like his subtle dig, you know, yeah, just, just <laughs> chopping at me. Yeah, it goes back to the mundane, boring stuff. Anyway, so you know, if if you were going to create a whole bunch of simulations, wouldn't almost all of them be something interesting or very enjoyable or very beautiful or very illuminating or something like that, right? Like something that would be good for some useful purpose, right? Yeah, so, so this is where where um, the popular level intellectuals like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson or Elon Musk will say something like, uh, and the, the philosophers don't do this, but the other folks do. And they'll say, well, look at the 2016 election. I mean, obviously, Donald Trump was not supposed to win. So the simulators thought, hey, how crazy would it be if we make Donald Trump win in the simulation? So they'll point to yeah. crazy things like that or, you know, the assassination of uh, Archduke. Franz Ferdinand or something like that and, and say, look, this is clearly where the simulators m made the simulated world more interesting or something like that. What, what do you make? Is it just sheer speculation? Just go, that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, you would expect some interesting things to happen in a real world, right? Um, but in a world that was programmed by intelligent beings, you'd expect more interesting things to happen. So yeah. like, yeah, okay, Donald Trump winning. That was pretty interesting. It was, uh -huh. Pretty entertaining there, <laughs> but like you know, it could have turned out that during his inauguration speech, like he peeled off his face and there's like you know an octopus head there or something, and with a lots of tentacles. Right, that's like a, if if the Simpsons were were programming the simulated world for sure. I think that is an, an episode of the Simpsons actually. Right. Okay. And it's sort of like there's all this stuff that you could easily do if it was a simulation, but that wouldn't happen if it was the real world. Yeah. Like there's a much wider range of interesting stuff uh, if it is a simulation. Okay. So um, let's say let's say machine functional mach machine functionalism is a viable option. Uh, there's this the there's this other philosopher Metcalf who kind of uh, further bolsters uh, the indifference principle at play in this argument and basically. Right. Is this Tom Metcalf? Yeah. Okay. He's a he's a former student from Boulder. So. Oh no way! <laughs> All right, that's fantastic. Glad well, so that he's doing stuff. That's hilarious. You've got a connection to everyone on uh, Earth in philosophy. Uh, so I mean, this suggests that you just have um, similar tastes to me, or something. Yeah, that could be. That could be. Well, yeah, that's probably true. Um, Compare the theories, Parker. Either either humor knows everyone in the world, or <laughs> you know, similar. Well, that's some that's kind of true. Direction. That could be that's true. true. Well, okay, so he, he gives this indifference principle, and uh, this is going to be interesting because if he's wrong, then maybe he could blame his teacher, and uh, if he's right, then his teacher is wrong. Uh, it, he's got this indifference principle, and he says, look, uh, given the possibility of nested uh, simulation, that within the simulation, they're making other simulations. Uh, it's Dwight Schrute makes Second Life in the office all the way down. There's going to, the, the majority of beings in the universe are going to be digitally conscious beings and not base reality beings that we take ourselves to be. If that's the case, then given this principle of indifference, you should think that you are a digitally conscious being, not a base reality being. Uh, what do you, insofar as I've represented the indifference principle accurately, what, what do you make of that? Is that, is that right? Is that a right use of the indifference principle? Yeah, I guess. Um, so I think the conditional probability claim is correct, right? So, uh, so if you accept that the majority of conscious beings, you know, like conditional on the assumption that the majority of conscious beings are simulated, um, you're probably simulated. Okay. Right. Um, but I don't know if you can get to that. I mean, you know, you were saying very early um, in this discussion that you wanted to make this argument that there's something self-defeating, right? Yeah. I and mean, this is a point where this comes in, right? Because I don't know how you estimate the proportion of beings who are simulated um, if you don't get to use your information about the external world, yes, it depends on thinking that you're correctly perceiving the external world. Right. You know, I don't know what the I don't know what the correct way of doing it is, but I think uh -huh. you can't just like assume, right? Like assume that everything is the way that it appears and reason about how the world is, and then get to the conclusion that everything isn't the way it appears. Right. It seems like at some point you've you're Wittgenstein kicking away the ladder. <laughs> right, and you know. And Wittgenstein thought that was fine, but um, you know, what if you kick away the ladder and then you fall down? Right. That that's kind of yeah. You've you've kicked away the the you've sawed off the branch which you've used to climb up onto the 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 claim in the first that place. You're sitting on this. There you go. Yeah, we're mixing metaphors here. Uh, 
Nate, what do you make of that, man? Because you always say I shouldn't go for the self-defeat, and here we go. <laughs> well, it's not – yeah, to be clear, it's not like I'm just like – against every instance of self-defeat <laughs> arguments, right? Because there is such a thing as self-defeat. Right. Um, it's it's just like in our conversations, uh, with, this might bore the audience, but like in our conversations, I feel like they just like creep up left and right. It's like, yeah, they do. here's here's a tool. I'm going to treat everything as a hammer because I cause I have self-defeat uh, of my, <laughs> That's in, in my philosophical like arsenal. So, um, yeah. but I, but I, I actually wonder if this is where we want to actually appeal to self-defeat um not because i'm just generally averse to it uh uh i think that uh so, so so this sounds right to me if my only evidence is that um most most conscious beings are inhabit a simulation if that was my total evidence it seems like then yeah i should be pretty confident i'm in a simulation okay but it's actually not my total evidence right i mean my total evidence actually um uh, consists of like claims about my immediate experiences, right? More specific claims. And I guess I'm thinking that, well, those, I mean, that evidence, right? So that, that total evidence, that actually is a uh, pretty well predicted by a real world hypothesis that's incompatible with this simulation hypothesis. Um, so even though it might be right, the conditional on just like the, the, the statistical information, uh, I should be really confident that I'm, I'm uh, in a simulation. It might not be true that, well, conditional on that, plus the specific facts about my immediate experiences, mm. that I should be confident I'm in a simulation. Rather, maybe I should be confident that, um, actually, no, I inhabit the real world in the 21st century and the month of June. Yeah, no, so, I mean, that's like the previous argument more than the self-defeat argument, right? So you could yeah. agree with with Metcalf that, you know, just conditional on most of the beings being simulated, you're probably simulated, but also most of the simulated beings have much more interesting experiences than we do. Uh, right? yeah. um, and also uh, less there, most of them are less perfect simulations, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, that's yeah. a good point. Okay. I like that. Cause I was, I was hoping we could tie that into a uh, refutation of simulation hypothesis. I wonder, I want to, I want to pose the self defeat that I have in mind and just see you guys shred it to pieces. Uh, hopefully yeah. not though. Can I ask yeah. a question real quick, though? Um, I guess I don't know when else I'm going to get a chance to ask this. So one thing I was wondering is whether or not um, whether or not Bostrom's theory even really counts as a skeptical theory. Yeah, that, I was going to ask that too. That's a great because, point. Because like you might you might think so, especially the way uh, you, Doctor Humor, uh, the way you characterize skeptical theories, they imply that most of our um, ordinary beliefs are not justified. Um, I'm not. I, it's not clear to me that Bostrom's committed to that. I've not read a whole lot of his work, but I. I I was thinking maybe we should think about his theory as more on the model of like say Barclay and idealism, right? So if you're if you're if you're going for idealism, you're not necessarily a skeptic. You just have like a different view of like what's fundamentally there, right? Like there's no matter if you're Barclay, and maybe if you're uh, and there's just ideas, and if you're someone like Bostrom, you might say um, or be confident that uh, actually it's all just code or something like that. And real, real quick too, uh, Bostrom also acknowledges that in a reply to objections on, on the websites, like simulationhypothesis.com okay. or something. And he says, look, he, he makes that point. He says, look, I'm not saying that all of our uh, beliefs aren't vertical or something. I always want to say, I think it's an entailment of, of the simulation hypothesis, though he would say it's not. No, dude. And uh, yeah, so so go ahead, Dr. Humor. This reminds me of um, you know what Barclay said, right? Like some in the dialogues early on, you know, I guess Hylas says that uh, he, he heard that Philonous was a skeptic, right? And uh, Philonous, the first thing Philonous says is, um, well, no, you know, just because I think matter doesn't exist, that doesn't mean I'm skeptical, right? <laughs> Maybe I'm perfectly certain that matter doesn't exist, right? Uh, so I'm not skeptical, <laughs> all right. Okay, and then Hylas amends the characterization of skeptics to include people who deny things that are obvious or whatever, something like that. So anyway, um, but then, you know, the other thing Barclay says is, no, you know, I'm not saying that tables and rocks and cars don't exist. I'm just saying they're ideas in the mind. <laughs> you know? yeah, right. They're perfectly real because, you know, that's what it is to be real, is to be an idea in your mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm that's I'm not denying common sense at all, and there's all this stuff about how completely commonsensical idealism is, right? Okay, and I just thought that was laughable. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, 
at a certain point, your account of the nature of a thing is so far from what everybody else thinks it is that you know you should stop saying that you're affirming the existence of that thing, right? It's mm -hmm. just not, right. So like if you think if if you say yes, there are rocks, but rocks are just ideas in your mind. No, you're you're denying that there are rocks, okay? <laughs> because like, like just the the ordinary concept is not compatible with it being an idea in your mind. Okay. Right. And then you're just like misusing language, okay? Anyway, so yeah, so like my view is, you know, Bostrom might say, oh, if we're in a simulation, our beliefs are still true, but I think not, right? I think like if you like of a simulation of a table is just not within the ordinary concept of a table, right? So if you're saying this is a simulation of a table, you're really saying there isn't a table here. So so maybe to, to bring this out even more and uh, uh, to make it more clear, which I don't think it will change things, but but Chalmers has this paper, uh, The Matrix as Metaphysics, and he goes more in the, the Matrix, which is like a brain in a vat, and says, qua, um, I don't know if he says qua, but I study theology, so we talk about qua moves. Uh, <laughs> so qua, you know, qua the Matrix, Neo is justified in believing that he's in a uh, uh, high rise in New York, but, you know, actually qua the real world, maybe he's in a, uh, he's a body in a vat in New Jersey. And so Chalmers says, well, it depends on what you're talking about. If you have Qua in the Matrix, yeah, his belief that he's in a sky, skyscraper is justified. Um, do you just, what do you make of that that argument? I mean, that you contention? know, notice how, um, yeah, so, you know, this is like uh, this is an old film, so I'm not sure if the viewers have watched it anyway. But notice how, like, what you're supposed to think in the film is that everybody's deceived. Like, right, exactly. And then exactly. When, he gets, when he gets pulled out, he finally sees reality. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, okay, but I think after you know that, then you can go around and talk about, you know, the buildings and cars and things like that. And then you'd be referring to virtual buildings and virtual cars and so on. Like, so once he knows the truth, then when he looks around in the matrix, he's no longer being deceived, right? Yeah. Like he sees a car and he knows that it's a virtual car or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Okay. So, so that's where I want to bring in my self defeat argument um, is that uh, you've been, so it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a warped Plantingian uh, proper functionalism. The, the simulated conscious being would be in that state of having a, a design plan in an environment where they're supposed to operate but their beliefs would not be directed at truth, but at falsity. And the, the falsity that it's directed at is that you live in base reality, that you, you we're all conscious beings. And I take myself to actually be at a real table, whatever tables are made out of in base reality, whatever the fundamental element, or whatever particle, super string, I take myself to be in base reality. But then I come to find out someone tells me or whatever, I, Bostrom comes and tells me I live in a, uh, or, or Morpheus says I live in a computer simulated world. Once I find out that I've been systematically deceived, uh, I would think that I have no reason to then trust the rest of my cognitive faculties, my impressions, my intuitions at all. And so I, I would think I would have, I would acquire like an undercutting defeater for all of my beliefs, including that belief that I now live in a computer simulation. What, what do you make of that, Dr. Humer? Um, well, um, I mean, so like I see why you would start to doubt your senses. I'm not sure that you should doubt your reasoning or intuition or even memory, right? That's what that's what Nate always says. Yeah. Cause because maybe that's that's like a priori, they have a priori justification or something. Well, um, you know, like it, you have a rational presumption that things are the way they appear, mm -hmm. and you acquired a defeater, which clearly applies to your sensory experiences, but I don't see that that defeater clearly applies to the rest of your cognitive faculties. If if I'm a if I I wonder if it's a if it's a difference between brain in a vat versus a simulated conscious being if if those you know we're saying those we're stipulating those are conceptually possible or whatever that they are possible uh, the the simulated being would be created to exist in a simulated world and think that he lives in base reality and then he's coming to find out that he's been created to think that he's been created to believe lies. And so I would think that all of the cognitive faculties, not just the, the per, uh, sensory perception ones, you'd acquire this belief because you say, well, I've been actually created to be deceived. Maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm grasping at straws here or something. Well, I mean, 
Um, was the purpose of the people who created the thing to maximize deception? Okay, so this is another great point, man. You sound so much like Nate. Um, in, in, in Bostrom's I, I, case, to be clear, it's the other way around. I'm influenced <laughs> by fingers like right, that. right, so, right. So, so in Bostrom's case, he doesn't he doesn't include deception or anything like that. But his whole case is the ancestor simulations, right? So he wants it's some it's our future ancestors are down the line want to see what it was like to live in 2021. So they make these digitally conscious beings who think they're living in 2021 in base reality. And so they actually are deceived, even though the intention is not let's fool these people and trick them. But actually, that is that is baked into the cake that they're they're not the real Parker. It's the a digital Parker who thinks he's the real Parker. Yes. Well, um, I mean, the people who made this simulation, like, I mean, as far as I'm understanding it, they give the people normal reasoning capabilities. Mm. And they just give them weird sensory experiences, right? Ah, uh, okay, okay. So their their reasoning cap uh, capacities could be exactly like those in base reality, but they're just presented with different stimuli. Yeah, like that's the way I, I always understand it. Um, you know, like you, they could program crazy people, like you know, because I don't know, they could do anything, right? They could program yeah. anything. So they yeah. could make some people who are just like, you know, terrible reasoners and like stuff that seems obvious to them is completely false and vice versa. <laughs> but how about our intuitions? So I have, you know, I have like an intuition that I'm not a brain in a vat or not a simulated conscious being. But th yeah. but that's, sim I would come to find out that that intuition is wrong. Yeah, I mean. Um, and I was given that intuition, right? I was made with that intuition. I mean, if that's an intuition, it's a weird example of one, right? Because uh, yeah. yeah. most intuitions are necessary truths or alleged necessary truths. Okay. Um, you know, but but I mean, it's true that when you hear the brain of that scenario, it usually sounds crazy to you. So, right? There's some kind of right. reaction. So, I, I guess I guess that's an intuition. I don't know. Yeah, maybe um, I'm just not clear on um in what what intuitions technically are in the in the literature. Yeah. And so, um, anyway, it's like, seeming maybe, yeah. Should should you think that that was like specifically programmed into you? I don't know. I mean, like, you know, as far as I understand, if I was creating a brain in a vat, I wouldn't have to do some special thing to make it think that it wasn't a brain in a vat. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. All I got to do is make the sensory experiences like normal. So that's that's why I think it might be there might be some some uh, discontinuity between a, an actual physical brain in a vat versus a digitally simulated conscious being. Well, I mean, you know, I would say similarly, if I was creating a simulated person, I don't have to do a special thing to make yeah. it think that it's not a sim. I just sure. I have to give it sort of like I have to make it normal. Yeah. If I figure out how to make a normal robot. That can <laughs> in the world and have normal inferences, then I can make one in a simulated world. Okay, all right. I think that it's simulated. So, so one follow up that which might help and might might hurt. So Neo wakes up from the Matrix, or yeah, he he, you know, you've seen the movie. He he wakes up yeah. uh, from the Matrix. For me, I would think that he is no longer justified in thinking he is in base reality because he just woke up from a systematic deception. So why ought he, why yeah. should he think now that he's just in base reality? He's been fooled systematically uh, before. So yeah. now, how does he know? And so an externalist would say, well, it just it happened. It, it, it yeah. matters what the case of the matter is. And it's like, well, he can't know that. So what do you make? Can can Neo be justified in believing that he is has escaped the matrix and isn't just in a next level of a, a nested simulation or nested matrix? Yeah, um, hard to say, right? I mean, um, I think there were I think there are some Star Trek episodes in which people turn out to be in sort of in simulations. They're, they're in some other reality. And I think there's um, there's at least one where like the character wakes up, but they're actually still in in like a fake reality. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, think, I think there's one with Commander Riker where he wakes up multiple times. OK. <laughs> anyway. So and then at the end, he's like, OK, finally, we're in reality. <laughs> but. You know, then you start start to wonder, right? You know, like especially if you too, went yeah. to more than one level, you should start to wonder if yeah. there's another level. Okay. Um, so, so perhaps it's the amount of levels that you go through. If you go through two or three, then you should think that, like, in, like Inception. <laughs> Inception would be a worse case than maybe Neo. Right. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know if even, I don't know if Neo has just my beliefs even at the end there. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, you know, let's say, you know, I would say they're less justified than ours are, so. Yeah. Although okay. I might, I, I think I would say, I don't even know that Neo is justified in believing he was, he was in the matrix, but not because there's some like in principle reason, right? That he couldn't be, but rather because if you watch the movie, like his information bearing on that matter is just so poor. Like somebody sent him an email, then some right. stranger put him in his car, or that he gave him some pills that gave him a mind altering experience. I, I don't know that like, just after that, I'd be like, oh my gosh, like my whole world is a lie. I might think I had a really weird night. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, if something like this happens to you, the most likely thing is that you're crazy and yeah. you're uh, having psychotic delusions and none of that happened. Right. And you should go to the, a mental institution. Man, <laughs> I never, I, I guess I never thought about the pills before, Nate, that like, this, this is what sometimes philosophers just pull out of the bag and be like, well, let's say you took a pill that, you know, destroyed all your justification. And it's like, that's kind of what happened to him. Yeah, he mm -hmm. should think maybe he's having a bad trip this whole time instead. That's a really interesting take on the whole movie, actually. <laughs> but, I, but, but I thought you were kind of like going for this idea that there's like an in principle reason or something that one could not discover they were a brain of that or in the matrix or anything like that. Like yeah. Parker. And right. Dr. Humor, like I take it you think, yeah, in principle, you could find out that you were um, in a simulation or in the matrix. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely get evidence of that. Uh, is it enough? I don't know, right? Because right? you know, when you think about most of the ways you could get evidence of it, the most likely explanation is that you're crazy rather than that you're really <laughs> in the matrix, but, right. Yeah. That's kind of an interesting, yeah. So I, I, I don't really know what to make of this, but like, I've always said so I've kind of worked myself into thinking this too. That because I, I go I I I mean surprise surprise from this conversation I really like your paper and I'm very sympathetic to that kind of approach like yours and Jonathan Vogel's and some others. Um, but I, I often wondered if an implication of the view is that um, is that you it, it would be extremely difficult to get evidence that um, that. Uh, the world is not as it appears. <laughs> um, like extreme, and 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 it's and not just extremely difficult. I've worried that maybe it's like actually, maybe it's actually impossible. Um, and if that's right, I actually just wonder what that says about um, about the quality of my evidence. That's where kind of like my my intuition that oh wait, this isn't this isn't like actually falsifiable like comes in and I get worried. Um, but I but I. I suspect that's a, that worry is somewhat misplaced. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you might worry if the real world hypothesis is unfalsifiable, because no matter what happens, but, you know, like I said this about the brain in the vat, like it was unfalsifiable. You might say, yeah, well, you know, no matter what happens, you can just say that's explained by the real world being a certain way. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. You have any sequence of experience, you could just say, yeah, well, maybe there are real things that are like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Although if you just have like the random static image, um, you know, is there a real world explanation of that? But yeah, maybe there's just like um, light and dark, <laughs> whatever, tiny light and dark things around <laughs> in front of you and you're seeing that. Um, but you know, it does seem like that would be a less, um, a less good theory, right? be mm -hmm. less good of an explanation than my current explanation, my current experiences. Um, anyway, um, but no, I mean, I don't, so I was saying like, well, you could definitely get evidence that you're a brain of that or in some simulation. Um, but you know, like maybe you would instead think that you were psychotic, um, but I'm not clear that that's compatible with the real world theory anymore, right? <laughs> like if you think that oh, you're right. seriously psychotic, so you're not really perceiving reality, yeah, good. I, I was thinking. I was thinking that like being psychotic was like a sub hypothesis of the real world. It's the real world, and, and I'm psychotic. But for you, it's like that's uh, that's all. That might be lumped into like uh, some kind of like nebulous. Yeah. I mean, maybe right. Like I don't. I don't know. But it shouldn't matter how you classify things, right? Um, but you know, so like the psychosis theory and the brain of that theory at some, like in some possible scenarios could be competing with each other. Um, and you know, like, you know, they could both be um, supported by a sufficiently weird sequence of experience. 
Um, and and you, so and you can get evidence for both. You're saying you could you can get evidence that you're you have psychosis, and you can get evidence that you're a brain in a vat. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so, like you know, if you have this experience where, um, like, it seems like the world freezes, and then like. I don't know. Oh, you know, like in, <laughs> see, this is a good, um, this is a good show for talking about other um, science fiction movies, right? So like in Total Recall, that's right. There's, there's this time when this guy tries to convince the Arnold Schwarzenegger character that he's um, in like in some kind of simulation, right? Yeah. And so here, you just got to take this pill, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so if that happens to you, <laughs> um, you know, like you can, you can have evidence that raises the probability of both of these alternative hypotheses, right? Uh, even if you describe the hypotheses so they're incompatible with each other, you can still have evidence for both of them. Uh -huh. Not for the conjunction of them, but you have evidence right. for each of them. And and against the sort of like normal um, scenario. In fact, yeah. it could be conclusive, right? Like yeah. you can have experiences so that you know that you're not just having like totally normal perceptions as a normal person. Yeah. It, it's funny you mentioned Total Recall. So it's all coming back to Philip K. Dick. The The Matrix was based on Philip K. Dick. The Total Recall was his... I love Philip K. Dick. This is what started for me thinking about it as well. But so like like Hillary Putnam would say, well, you couldn't get evidence because that would you would derive this contradiction because you think you're a brain in a vat, but the concepts you have of vat and brain, uh, those refer to the simulated world and not to the external world. So you're trying to you're trying to like reason about the other world, though all of your conceptions are not, uh, none of your conceptions uh, are causally related to those at all. And so maybe, yeah. but, but I mean, I think that commits you to ex uh, content externalism or semantic externalism or something. So yeah. maybe we don't want to go that route, but what do you make of, of Putnam's um, it's self self refutation uh, line? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, interesting argument. The only problem is that, like, I don't agree with the semantic yeah. externalism yeah. premise. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, so the Twinner thought experiment shows something, but I don't think it shows that. Um, but I think it shows that, um, like, well, at least some of your concepts have um, causal conditions. Okay. With, like, um, kind of in the meaning of them. Yeah. So, like, so part of the meaning of water has something to do with our having causally interacted with it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the thought experiment doesn't show that every concept is like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't show that there aren't other elements. Right? So like one of the conditions for a thing to be water is that you have to have causally interacted with it. But I don't think that's sufficient. It's just like one of the conditions to be yeah. water. Okay. okay. And so like, okay, so there's a table here. And one of the conditions for it to be a real table might be that it's made out of um, matter and maybe to be matter, it has to be something that I interacted with. But also there might be another condition that it has to be like in space outside me or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and maybe that has to not be merely a simulated object. Yeah. Okay. So we, yeah, we bake it in there. That's, that's really good. Man, we covered so much. This has been so fantastic. Dr. Humor, thanks for your time. Nate, thanks for helping me not uh, step on myself too much here. <laughs> This has been really fun. Any any anything to add be before we uh, before we log off here? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I can assure you, you are not a brain in a vat. All right. <laughs> one of one of my colleagues once um, suggested to me that I am a brain in a vat, and his his purpose was to try to give me some evidence. Right? Yeah. Look, I just gave you some evidence that you're a brain in a vat. <laughs> so now you have a defeater for all of your perceptual beliefs, right? Mm. And so. Um, so, you know, I want to not do that to anyone else. So I assure everyone else that they're not brains and vets. Thank you. That's huge. Yeah. And, and you're not a digitally, uh, you're not a sim, you're not a simulated yes. being. That's right. Uh, because machine functionalism is false and for all sorts of other reasons. Awesome. Well, uh, this has been a super fun, uh, fantastic conversation. Uh, look at the, the old episodes that I have with Dr. Humor and with Nate. And uh, hopefully we can do this again. We can get some more episodes uh, turning out on some crazy ideas, which really help us think about all of reality and ourselves. Uh, but that's going to have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies. And as always, all glory to God.